All right, we are live. So hello to anybody out there who is watching as we're recording Indie Talks episode 40 with Fred Hicks. Um, I'm going to ask hello. We're going to do a few seconds of silence, and then we're going to have to introduce ourselves again. Uh, but that's radio, folks. I guess that's how it works. So let's, uh, let's do five seconds of silence, and then we'll jump into this thing. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Indie Talks, episode 40. Tonight, I am joined by Fred Hicks. Fred, how are you? Tired. So, so very tired. <laughs> for, for those who don't know, um, Fred uh, has a full-time job, and he also has a full-time job. So he's working two full-time jobs, because he is a parent, uh, and he also runs this, this company called Evil Hat, which, which I'm sure most of us have all have all heard of. We'll, we'll be covering mostly the evil hat end of this stuff tonight. But. Cool. <laughs> so, um, before the kids, before the, the hat was evil, or eviler, um, what was the first thing, as we dive right into episode 40 here, um, what was the first thing that got you into gaming at the tabletop? What, what was the first thing that you remember, anyways? Dice on the playground in third grade. Third grade? Yep. Yep. Uh, my friend uh, uh, Eamon was playing with some of the polyhedrals from one of the red box sets. Uh, uh, and uh, I you know, hadn't seen anything other than six-sided dice with pips uh, prior to that point, and I was just fascinated by this idea that there could be you know, dice that were different shapes. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't know that, at least the way I think of of gaming now, that what we did following the discovery of those dice was really tabletop gaming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, we, uh, but I, well, the thing, the thing that really does stick out for me from from those from those early like bombing around as a third grader. Yeah, um, uh, D and D memories is uh, already uh, Eamon and I uh, starting to you know hack the system. Um, uh, we're like, well, three D six gives you some awesome stats, but three D twelve would make you even more <laughs> awesome. Uh, so we just rolled up our characters with three D twelves and had these you know, <laughs> enormous bonuses and just rolled over the things that um, uh, you know it was total total power fantasy stuff. That's um, that's an awesome age to get into it because you're a little bit beyond for most of us, anyways. The shoving the dice up in your nose phase, but yeah, you're you're still before the well. That's not what the rules really say phase, and there's so much openness. I, I just I remember that my friend Scott and I, when we first discovered it, about that's um, we we're a little bit older, but not much older. Um, we found this death spell called Fame Death, and it was the most powerful spell that we had ever found because you point your finger at something and boom, it dies. <laughs> Until we actually sat yeah. down and read the thing like two years later and realized, oh, you know, we're leaving this horde of monsters behind the dungeon, waking up after, I don't know, 1d4 melee rounds going, what the hell just happened? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it was fun while we were doing it. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think a, a lot of the, I mean, even just all the way up to high school, uh, uh, gaming time for me was not... Super gamey, yeah. So to speak. I mean, there was a lot of uh, a lot of what some people have referred to as the lonely fun of you know just sitting down solo with the rules, making characters, and yeah. was, you know. So I kind of think of that as a you know a good what is it nine year stretch of <laughs> of, of of making characters and and you know. Hacking with systems, maybe doing like a one and one kind of thing, but it was very, very rare that I got the opportunity to know enough uh, uh, kids, uh, um, you know, my age or whatever, mm. to to game with. Um, uh, you know, I was awkward, <laughs> uh, as as many of us were. Um, and uh, sadly, that's kind of my life right so, now. <laughs> yeah, well, I make a lot of characters. Then, yeah, yeah, we never. <laughs> yeah, we, well, that's the circle of life. We do, we do come full circle. <laughs> and, right? Yeah. Now, now, now that I make games and have kids, <laughs> that's boy, it. Yeah, or exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, so that that yeah. sounded like a, like early design school for you, almost. You know, like a nine year. Oh, sure. I mean, th there was there was no there was no sense, I think, at any point of my 
uh, you know, delving into role-playing games that I didn't feel like I could mess with the rules. Sure. Or, you know, um, so the games and their their designs have never really felt that, that sacrosanct, uh, that inviolate. Um, you know, you could just get in there and change it. I, one of the first things I, I uh, my friend, I knew a guy named Merlin um, in sixth grade. Real name or uh, assumed name? Actual name. Wow, that's cool. Um, yeah. Uh, and he and I, uh, you know, we did some of that one-on-one -on -one stuff, um, but, uh, you know, uh, I remember one of the earlier editions of Gamma World was current at that time. Um, and we, you know, took it, ripped out the random mutation tables, and turned it into a um, misfit superheroes game. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, just did all sorts of of uh, uh, crazy stuff with that, but yeah, I mean, that was that was my main mode of of play of interaction with role playing games during those nine years was just messing around with them, you know, making horrible games from <laughs> from any adult perspective, but um, but you know it was a, it was a way to like engage the material and and just really. Uh, uh, I don't know, get inside of systems. And sure. as a result, you know, coming into the actual playing of them uh, time period, at, uh, which, you know, I started to find more people who were uh, who were also into the hobby uh, around high school time. Um, uh, you know, I just got... Uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, I, I just came to it having, you know, felt like... It was all about sure. uh, tools and systems and, and and that sort of stuff, and settings never never really clicked for me. It took mm. it took me a long time to come around to understanding the value of the setting component. Did that come in of, high school? Uh, role playing games? Yeah, not really. Yeah. I mean, I think I th I think that probably started to click for me. Um, although I still didn't have a lot of patience for setting material as written in yeah. role playing games. Yeah. Um, for a variety of reasons, uh, which we can or can't get into, your, your choice. Um, uh, uh, with the Amber Diceless role-playing game, mm -hmm. in, which uh, uh, took off for me in college. Oh, cool. Um, uh, so, yes, if you sit down and look at publication dates, you can figure out a number of things. About sure, them. absolutely. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, uh, and... And uh, you know this this remains a lesson that's very true for me even to till today. Uh, Amber did an excellent job of, uh, I mean, licensed so it had the it had the you can go read these novels and boom you know the setting. But sure, uh, in terms of how the the game itself conveyed uh, conveyed setting, it was through the characters, it was through the elders, uh, uh, and and things like that. Through the powers also to an extent. Right. But, right. Um, but it it really showed me that uh, setting stuff that clicks often clicks because it's coming at you through its personalities rather than its geography mm -hmm. or you know any number of other elements. And um, you know, and you know there, there's a certain magic in and of itself to sort of pulling back the curtain and seeing how these things work, and then realizing suddenly I can do that. It may not yep. be good, it may not be perfect, but I can do that, and then I can bring it to my friend, and he can play this, and. We'll find out what's wrong with it, but still. And people yeah. come to that, I think, at different times in their lives. Some people may never come to that. They may just enjoy, you know, watching the show and participating. But there's something well, pretty cool about finding that aspect out. Yeah, and concurrent with the whole, um, like, uh, Amber uh, Diceless becoming, like, just the hugest component of my gaming DNA uh, around that time, uh, I was also, uh, you know, starting to meet the Internet for the first time. Um <laughs> And you know this is this is pre World Wide Web and everything. Yeah. Um. Uh. You know I think Mosaic. Uh. Uh. You know came out during my time in college. Yeah. You're you're like me, like days of Usenet and Gopher and all that fun yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but nevertheless, um, thanks to the magic of Usenet, uh, uh, Fudge came uh, mm -hmm. into existence uh, and and got onto my radar. So, when I wasn't tinkering with, uh, when I wasn't playing Amber Diceless, I was tinkering with Fudge and occasionally, you know, running a few things. Uh, so yeah, I, I I met Fudge early on, um, and that was that really clicked with like all of the 
uh, pre-college experience that I'd had um, uh, in terms of it being, uh, you know, very much there for a gearhead. Someone sure. wanted to get in there. Um, you know, the, to, to begin play first, change the rules. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of a principle of it. Um, <laughs> Would you say and, that those and, two things? And that made tons of sense to me because that's oh, yeah. the way I'd always been interacting with role playing games to first play change the rules. And would you say those two game systems sort of just kind of stuck with you in the background, all these... Abs- absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, if you if you, you know, trace that line straight forward to um, 1999, 2000 or so, mm-hmm. um, it was the com- combination of wanting to run Amber but without but with dice Yeah. Um, that uh, gave birth ultimately to Fate um, uh, by way of Fudge. So... Oh. Uh, you just, so yeah, you just, those those two things right there. You just did an awesome segue for me, so thank you. So <laughs> tell us a little, <laughs> tell us a little bit about where Fate and Evil Hat came from. Uh, it came from uh, let's see. I've answered this a number <laughs> number of times, <laughs> but I'm, I'm uh, uh, it really. I mean, it came from that college experience that I was talking about, mm-hmm. um, uh, and then you know after years of doing Amber Diceless. Uh, uh, I, you know, I eventually got to the uh, diceless. Uh, the diceless was fun, but a little too much fiat. Uh, so we wanted to bring back in the the you know the impersonal, impartial, the fickle uh, 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 hand of fate, as it were, uh, to uh, uh, to the the play experience through the dice. Um, and because fudge had been my other kind of big college DNA thing. Um, uh, I went to that, ran a game called Crown of Amber, um, which was uh, the, you know, just basically fudge with a tiny amount of adjustment. Yeah. Um, uh, fitted together with uh, uh, the Amber setting, and that ran for a while until I um, you know, had a career move that sent me from, I was at Maryland at the time, uh, sent me out to California. Mm. Um, and my friend Rob Donahue also moved out to California for unrelated reasons around the same time period. Um, so we connected back up in California, and um, uh, us and our wives or fiance, depending on what the timeline is, I think. Well, wives now. So yeah. um, <laughs> future wives. Uh, we're 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 on a, we're on a uh, uh, trip to Tahoe. We spent some time there, and then we're driving back. And Rob and I are in the same car together, <laughs> which, if you want to get a word in edgewise, is not a place you want to be, <laughs> because Rob and I just talk. Mm. Um, so that hap- was happening uh, uh, so much that uh, my my wife uh, switched cars <laughs> so that she could be with Deborah for a while. And, and talk to somebody. Rob's wife. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> word in edgewise issue. Yeah. Um, uh, and Rob and I just kept going, um, and that and that car conversation back from Tahoe was us talking about the fudge game that I had run in Maryland, and uh, what would we do different hmm. to do the next one? Uh, and the what we would do different uh, conversation essentially got us by way of I think some discussion of. Uh, Seventh C and uh, Over the Edge, uh, and a few other things, to the idea of aspects. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, originally, Fate is essentially Fudge Engine plus aspects and like one or two other like weird sure. tricks. But you know, because it was Fudge to begin play, first change the rules. So yeah. those were the those were the rules changes. And then, you know, through a number of iterations over the course of many years, <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, 2001, 2002, rolling on forward to today, um, uh, you know, we, we've kind of been coming to terms with the impact that those few starting rules mm. had and then changing more and more of the system to make it, you know, its own thing. And... Uh, uh, you know, with the Fate Core release, we uh, wrote everything from the ground up. Um, uh, you know, and it is now kind of a fudge der- derivative, but it is it is really and had already started to I think in the 
uh, Spirit of the Century to Dresden Time Period, it's really become its own thing. It's got sure. it's got some overlap, um, but uh, uh, there's a lot of core functions to the system now that uh, have have taken it off of that um, that base. But okay. it's certainly where we started. Now, um, take take a step back even further. How did you and Rob first meet? <laughs> Um, well, um, like everything in my adult life, it all traces back to Amber. Um, uh, uh, re re remember what I was telling you I was meeting the Internet? Yes. Uh, during college? Well, part of meeting the Internet uh, involved um, saying, okay, well, I'm on the Internet, and I'm into the Amber Dices thing. Where can I find that? Or, you know, is there, is there any way to engage with that on this, mm -hmm. on this magical texty box? Um, and... Uh, I found out that there was a uh, MUSH, uh, which is a uh, mm -hmm. acronym for multi-user shared hallucination. It's basically uh, interactive online text-only Zork. So the MMOs before there was were graphics, graphical elements yeah. to them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, uh, and uh, this one was for uh, uh, playing Amber Diceless, essentially. Um, but with this massive population, massive, you know, as in there could be, you know, a hundred people logged right, on right. various various places. But it had a kind of uh, physicality to it. You know, there there are rooms with descriptions on it. You were characters. You had objects. You can walk around and do stuff. And they and uh, you know the dice's mechanics were are you know dirt simple enough that they just came up with a way to kind of <laughs> compare your stats and go, okay, well you're you're hugely outclassing me, so um, I'm going to you know, do a bunch of emotes about how I'm right. flailing as you're kicking my ass, or or, or what have you. Um, uh, and it was on Amber Mush that I met uh, Rob Donahue, Lydia Leong, Cam Banks, uh, Jim Butcher. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it wasn't on Amber Mush, but I eventually got her over there. It's where I met C.E. Murphy mm -hmm. um, in in the mushing habit. Um, a bunch of other people too. Um, uh, uh, so we, I, it, I either met most of the people I know now um, through Amber Mush, or through people who I met through Amber Mush. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so it's, you know that's that's the uh, that's the center of the Kraken, <laughs> um, uh, uh, the uh, whatever whatever you want to call it. But yeah, uh, so all all those various connections got made there, um, and oh. You know, Rob and I did not see eye to eye when we first met, in part <laughs> because, uh, well, I was young. Yeah. Um, you know, and being mm -hmm. in my early early twenties and uh, uh, very impressed with myself, um, I didn't have a lot of patience for uh, bad typing. Ah. Because you know, your text is how you, uh, how you exist. Sure. Those in a much, yeah. Ones. And uh, Rob, as we are <laughs> fond of joking, types with flippers. So, uh, you know, he, 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 he mashed the keys and the autocorrect didn't exist, so I'd occasionally get, like, oh, frustrated <laughs> for this completely stupid reason of he had typos. Um, but uh, eventually, um, one of the things I tended to do on... Uh, Spring break was drive around to people who I knew online um, uh, to meet them, and I did this whack ass. Uh, I'm gonna because I was at uh, University of Florida at the time. I'm gonna go out to Stillwater, Oklahoma, meet somebody there, meet a couple people there, then go from there over to Maryland, <laughs> where I know a bunch of people. Then I'm gonna drive back to Florida. So it was my crazy triangle trip. Um, and when I got to Maryland, um, there was a big one shot Amber game and Rob was one of the people there and he was one of the GMs. Yeah. And you know, I kinda got to know him a little bit there and and, and so forth. But it you know, as as usual, um uh you know, when you're kind of at loggerheads with people <laughs> online, meeting them in person tends to diffuse a lot of that yes. stuff. And, yeah. Uh, I, I think that certainly certainly happened there, but um, I didn't get a huge amount of time there. But that's kind of where I mark as having really met Ooh. Rob. Um, uh, uh, and like my 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 key memory of this, because uh, I think the game had like three GMs because of the sheer number of people we had. Right. It was like a twenty four person game. Um, uh, so Rob takes a couple people off into another room because they're 
you know, they have, as usual in Amber, have have haired off to do, yeah. like, yeah. whatever their submission is, uh, uncovering a completely different part of the plot that the rest of us aren't even experiencing. So he's in this other room, da da da, -da and you, you start to hear some loud noises, and then he sticks his head in the room and says, Jeff, Jeff was one of the other GMs, Jeff! What did you have in mind with the dragon? <laughs> All of us were just... Dragon? <laughs> dragon? Um... Uh, and you know that. <laughs> then he closes the door <laughs> after Jeff j verbally shrugs at him. Yeah. Um. Uh. And 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 runs with it. Um. But yeah, that was uh. uh yeah. Awesome. Uh, but but then uh through those same sorts of connections that I made there, there were other people as well, of course. Um. I uh, eventually ended up back in Maryland after going to, I guess, the echo of the same trip, going to <laughs> o Oklahoma State for grad school and getting mm -hmm. my, getting to the end of my first year going, wait a minute, grad work requires research, and I hate <laughs> research. Perhaps I've made a mistake. Uh, so I bailed out on, on uh, grad school and said, okay, so what's next? Um, and what's next was a bunch of people I knew through Ambermush working at an internet company in Maryland, so I'm like, mm. ah, perhaps I will, I will head in that direction, and, you know, they found me a job in customer service, um, and, uh, came out and started that, uh, That's and fun. Rob was local, and at that point, you there know, you go. Uh, Rob and I and a few other people kind of were the core of people who would GM games. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, you know, that's, that's where they overlap wow. and, and various stuff started. And less than a lifetime later, here you are talking to me on a podcast about your company that you have with Rob. That makes awesome games. Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty cool. So one of the things that really distinguishes Evil Hat as a company um, from other companies that I have bumped into and other folks sometimes is that you guys are extremely open about every single thing that you do, minus the, you know, you're not going to say what you have for lunch unless people are following you on G Plus or Facebook or something. Well, but even then. I, 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 I might. You, know, you might. Je yeah. Jeff, Jeff Tidball has referred to me as pathologically transparent. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's pretty fair. So when did that decision happen? And, and how has it worked out for you so far? And I'm going to guess good because you're still doing it. But Yes, it's worked out very well for me. Mm. Um, very well for the company, very well yeah. for, for us, very well for the fans, very well for other publishers. It's just worked out very well. Um, uh, <laughs> if you de detected a bit of a fanatical gleam in my eyes, I said that. <laughs> It's perhaps because I'm a believer and I've been drinking that yeah, Kool-Aid for a while. There you go. Um, so, you know, there's your grain of salt. Uh, but uh, what do I want to say about that? The decision to go transparent, um, I don't know that I ever perceived it as a decision. Mm, it, just it just simply was, was what I was doing. <laughs> what it was what I would be doing. And I, I believe that it was a reaction uh, to uh, what it was like to... Transition from ah, I'm screwing around. Here's a free PDF, whatever. Right. right. That's that. That wasn't really publishing from our perspective. <laughs> it was just uh, sharing, right? So we started with sharing as the way that we published, mm -hmm. um, uh, and that ha that's kind of an act of transparency in and of itself. Um, but uh, as we made the decision to take Evil Hat into being a commercial entity um, instead of just sort of this banner under which we ran games. Right. right. Uh, uh, there was not ease of access to a lot of information of how to do publishing yeah. at all. And my reaction to that was but there should be. <laughs> right? This is, this is not something where I feel like people benefit from it being a secret or sure. you know people benefit from someone not taking the time to write something that they learned down in a place that's public yeah it's not like working so, for Matthew or coke or yeah so i just started i don't know tossing off information <laughs> as a side effect cuz i'm like oh learned here look learned yeah. Yeah. um and uh you know people responded very well to it so i kept doing it um and uh, ugh, I just, I, every time I ran into the, the sort of older mentality of um, this game is my secret technology. Right. Keep it and, secret, and, keep it safe. Right, until, until it is 
published, and yeah. then yeah. and then I will sit behind my murky G DM screen like wall and behind which exist all the secrets of how well it's performing and who I talk to for what and and what the numbers were n no <laughs> you know I just oh it, it it drove me up a wall um you know and then I get into it for a while and uh you know I was working uh for uh, indie press revolution for a while mm -hmm. there um uh, I was helping staff uh, their their booths at a few conventions, um, you know. And there's one of those moments where someone from another company comes over to check out all these various games, and yeah, you know, I'm I'm super excited about everything indie at the time, and I'm telling them about all these different games, um, and I know that they I forget I forget who it was honestly, but sure. um, I know that they were working on. Um, or had a Western themed game, so I'm like, oh, well, you might want to check out uh, what was it at the time? Dust Devils, um, Dogs in the Vineyard, you know, a few mm -hmm. other things. And they backed away, like I just <laughs> said, said, perhaps you'd like to ingest some live plutonium, <laughs> um, because they had the you know this this attitude that oh, we can't consume any game product that is in any way however superficial, similar to this other thing that we're because it might cause a legal entanglement. I'm like, right. really? <laughs> really? Uh, you know, and the, the, the funny thing is, I mean, I think that the fact that that kind of attitude did not exist, by and large, in the, the chunk of the indie sphere that was typically represented sure. by Indie Press Revolution... That as much as anything was probably why I was <laughs> particularly excited about uh, indies at the time. I mean, some of the games were great, some of the games were good, some of them were not as good, but um, the, it was a very transparent, cross-pollinating, hey, I'm going to take this mechanic from there because that's cool, and I'll say thank you in the mm -hmm. notes or whatever, but that was it. And there was none of that, you know, ah, that's right. plutonium kind right. of... Uh, uh, like radioactive reaction, but that reaction seemed much more like what <laughs> everything outside of that that indie bubble um, uh, was 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 like. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know. I've just been I've just been pounding on that for the oh shit! It's the past decade now, isn't it? Yeah. Oh <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Um, yeah, for for the past decade or ish, uh, uh, you know, I've been pushing for that, and it's it's certainly not a default um, uh, for companies at this point. But there's mm -hmm. a lot more of that notion that transparency is not a, a bad practice, not not a yeah. you know not poisonous, not plutonium. It's it's you know in some ways advisable, and it very much uh, plays into what you know didn't exist at the time that I started doing it, but certainly has come about. Um, uh, or at least has changed forms and become something much bigger. Um, the the whole like social media sure. uh, uh, reality, um, where your audience is as your 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 headcount, the amount of people you reach is pretty close to your capital. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. You know, uh, as, as, particularly with the rise of crowdfunding stuff. Yeah. Um, so that you know, that, I don't know. That's all in the that's all in the soup <laughs> of. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, right pathology, right time, uh, 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 sort of thing. You know, I, I, uh, tra transparency has turned out to be a great thing for me to have started doing yep. before social media came along. Um, Absolutely. And uh, uh, what was the other thing? There's, there's, there's another thing that. Oh yeah. Um, and deciding to become a, a, a publisher and like sharing numbers and stuff like that was a great thing to do right as print-on-demand technology was starting mm. to become actually viable. Uh, so. Um, you know, those are those are kind of two serendipity elements that have turned out to be pretty pretty good for how you know I just decided yeah. that's the way that we needed to be do, doing what we were doing with Evil Hat. Oh yeah, right place, um, right time, absolutely, and, and yeah. it worked really well. And I think it does a real service to other folks as well who are interested in either getting into the game of, of publishing or writing or doing art for or what have you for for games, uh, board games, card games, role playing games, because they can take a look at what like you write. 
uh, what Daniel Souls writes, what what um, uh, Evil Hat is putting online, and say, "Oh, this is what it's really like. This is what I can expect if I am this successful." So, yeah. and you know, others of us do it as well for on a much much smaller basis, and give a little bit more maybe of a realistic case for most folks of this is what it's really like if you have three PDFs out there and you're selling four of them in a month or you know something along those lines. Which yeah, is I'm glad you brought up Daniel Solis too, because mm -hmm. if there's anybody who's more transparent than me, it's him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he pretty much is a reality show of gaming and game design. And yeah, I, I, I mean, he just <laughs> opens yeah. up his the, the doors to his uh, head, and you just look in all day. And that's it. And I I mean that in the best possible way, not in a survivor Absolutely. way. Yeah, but um, he, I mean, he's a real inspiration for a lot of folks too, because whenever anybody gets stuck, they can go to your website, they can go to his website, they can just read a couple of articles <laughs> and be reinvigorated. And say, okay, well, they just discuss these four ideas, and what if I did that instead of this, and if I move this over, and boom, you're off and running. So I, I think that's really cool that folks like you are doing this, yeah. uh, and I applaud Evil Hat also and you for for being so open and for letting me and everybody else see kind of what it's really like to, to be out there. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's some enlightened self-interest in that too. Right? <laughs> of course. When, when 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 you're that transparent, and you screw up, <laughs> you don't get you don't get anywhere near the kind of Blame and yeah. bad, yeah. bad in a vacuum of information, speculation, or you know any of the stuff that can turn, you know, the, a PR issue into a nightmare. Uh, you know, in, into a nightmare, right? I mean, it, generally, you've got because you've been transparent, you have such a I, I, abnormally is not the right right. When I'm, it's the adjective I'm going to. You're, you're more. You know what? It's, it's, you, you have such an abnormally informed population of fans that. You know the normal stuff, where people would say things about companies that's just flat out untrue, right, and right. nobody would contradict it. You know there are ten people there who are like, no, that's not <laughs> no, true at all, yeah. and just like, yeah. you know, cite, citation, citation, citation. <laughs> um, and it just it it it's a real, it's a it's it it's turned out to be its own kind of safety net. Sure, and I think it brings back a little bit of what you were talking about earlier about when you first interacted with Rob and then you actually met him. Our social yeah. media today is how a lot of people meet a lot of people. And when you meet somebody, when you interact with them in real time, in real life, it sort of diffuses a lot of that, ah, I'm anonymous and I can say whatever I want, sort of, because yeah. they're not anonymous anymore and neither are you. Yep. So yeah. I, I like that aspect. Yeah. Also, about, about seven years ago, I... Um, I, you know, I had uh, in my in my younger time, hmm. as you might have picked up on, um, <laughs> I was I was a bit more incendiary. Uh, you know, I was a bit more of an internet warrior. <laughs> um, but uh, particularly as I started to make the transition into commercial publication and so forth, uh, you know, I kind of had a reality check with myself of. Uh, you need to decide to be a better person online. You just need. <laughs> Make that deliberate choice. You know, when you're angry, say, "No, oh, this is ticking me off. I need to walk away and yeah. do it." And don't. And I still fail on that occasionally. But uh, you know, I've had seven years. I've replaced all the cells in my body, or so they say. <laughs> um, uh, so you know, now I've been I've been faking it until I've made it. Now you're a new I'm man. Now, yeah. I'm not. I, I'm now mostly the person I seem to be online. But you know, <laughs> er, er, early er, early on, it really felt like I was. You know, doing a bit of living a fiction with the aspirationally, you right, know, I was, right. I was trying to become the that guy, and you know, transparency was a component of that, um, in 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 the sense of, uh, it's a, it's an actively helpful stance, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know. Making that part of it, and and you know, also kind of clicking it together with notions like uh, you know, if somebody anybody asks me a question, take the time and actually write them a personalized right, right. answer. Um, uh, you know, um, and uh, rather than you know, something more, I don't know, distanced or or wholesale or or or, or something like that. Sure. Um, yeah. So all of that has kind of. Kind of meshed together too in terms of uh, personal reinvention, so it's it's a it's an odd thing to reflect on when I when I realize you know who I who I what I behaved like and who I thought of myself as you know then right. versus now. So are we going to expect the um, the self help uh, tour from Fred Hicks coming out anytime soon? <laughs> self help tour. <laughs> uh, 
You know, I guess I could do that, but I doubt I will ever have time. Sure, yeah, of course. Um, Too busy so, making games! Yeah, I, I want to switch gears a little bit here, and this brings us to, to my first beef with you. Uh, or with Evil Hat, I should Uh-oh. say. Yeah, and, and this is not a big one as, as far as beefs go. Uh, it's actually going to be a beef in your favor. Um, oh, excellent. It's that, those, are, those are my favorite kind. The, yeah, of course. It's um, Goddamn Zeppelin Attack. <laughs> um, which is a game that's that's forthcoming. That um, okay, let's let's see. First of all, it's a card game, which I love. Second of all, it's a deck builder, which I really love. Third of all, it's a deck builder that utilizes mechanics in different ways than other deck builders do. Damn you all! Um, and, it's and, a, it's, and it's an unusually small deck builder yeah, in terms. It, it, it does not sprawl uh, right. uh, in, in quite the same way. It looks um, like because it plays there's a lot fast. of focus on on. Yeah, it, it plays fairly fast, and yeah. but it its tempo is just different because yeah. it's not buy a ton of things every every turn, you know, do sorts of things. It's right. kind of, you know, carefully use what you've got, um, save up three turns, get a new thing, and uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff that then cycles back into uh, the decks and so forth. So it, 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 uh, it just does not need the huge, huge stacks and piles of cards. You're, you're not making this better for yourself. You realize that. <laughs> so now, also, it has Zeppelins. Yes. Also, it has sentient gorillas. Yes. Now I'm going to have to buy this damn thing. You are, and the Kickstarter launches right at the end of this month, I think. Oh. The 28th. All right. I, th- I think well, it's on the 28th. It's it's going to take a couple of, um, of days to get this podcast set up, and it's actually going to be launching on the 29th is my target date. So I'm going to have a link in here to this Kickstarter, right and I will ameliorate my bad feelings by having everybody else go out <laughs> and buy this damn thing as well. So it looks yeah, like Eric, a really cool game. It is a very cool game. Uh, Eric Vogel, uh, uh, the... Uh, the, the lead designer on this incarnation of the concept. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it it started as a completely different game, and then, you know, through some some soul searching and and does this is this doing exactly what we want? Uh, uh, then shifted gears completely, um, fell into uh, Eric's lap, and uh, out went in a very different direction. That became the compact deck builder. Yeah. But yeah, we're gonna. Uh, yeah, we're 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 gonna give it, I think, um, a price tag of twenty bucks, which oh. is also unusual for a deck builder. Uh, I mean, th- there's there's gonna be uh, like some shipping charges on top of that, so I think mm. the actual reward tier is thirty because it's you can't ship it media mail and there's all the packaging stuff. And but but we'll th- th- that'll be a flat cost, and you can right. add as many copies in as you want. And maybe if we will hit some stretch goals, there might be some other stuff that'll go in the box, and you know things like that. So, um, well, let's let's face facts so, yeah. here. I, I have a family of four, and if we're going to go to the movies and get an hour and a half of mediocre entertainment, we're going to spend a hell of a lot more than thirty bucks. Uh, the same. You very family, likely are. Yeah, is now I, I've grown my own gaming group, so my daughters are now old enough <laughs> to actually play this game. That's the only means, way to make parenting and gaming exactly, work. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Which means for thirty dollars, you're looking at hours and hours of entertainment, uh, as as opposed to you know an hour and a half of some animals talking. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, um, it looks like an awesome game. Can you tell us just a little bit more about it? You said the Kickstarter is launching on the twenty eighth. Yep. Uh, you're going to yeah. get to you're going to get to see all of the cards. Uh, mm-hmm. if, at the moment you back, much like we did with the fake core Kickstarter, yeah. um, uh, even one dollar, there's going to be a backers-only post, um, and you can download the print-and-play version of it. Um, uh, uh, you know, day of launch, uh, and uh, yeah, it's got. We, we've al- already got out um, a, a teach video, an instructional video for yeah. how to how to how to play that. That's over on YouTube. Um, uh, and uh, I don't. It's, you you play. You play. Let me see. Let me see if I'm. I'm, I'm bad at this pitching thing, unfortunately. <laughs> um, especially extemporaneously. So, uh, uh, so you play one of the four. One of four uh, villainous masterminds from the mm-hmm. Spirit of the Century universe. Um, Gorilla Khan. So there's your your sentient ape. Um, Jacqueline Frost, uh, Der Blitzmann, um, and the Walking Mind. Uh, so you're either a disembodied brain, an electrical madman, a uh, um, an ice powers using uh, 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 semi mystical villainess, mm-hmm. or a you know, talking ape, yeah, um, uh, talking ape slash conqueror, um, and uh, yeah, everybody has a flagship. 
Um, everybody has the, uh, the start deck that has an assortment of um, defenses, attacks, and minions. Yep. Um, and the minions are essentially deployed in various ways to get to, to complete schemes that give you resources that you can use to buy cards. Um, the attacks and defenses do what you'd expect. Um, <laughs> If mostly what you'd expect, um, and it's got a uh, it's got a very interesting uh, mechanic uh, where uh, attack and defense is is essentially pass fail. Um, uh, if you have a defense card, it defends against an attack. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, various conditions can either cause like some additional side effects, like oh, I get to draw a card because this was this was a successful defense uh, kind of thing. Um, and sometimes you end up being forced to use a defense or attack that's more powerful than the zeppelin that launches it <laughs> can handle. So that forces that zeppelin to retreat to kind of build itself back up. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's that's how some of your zeppelins will will cycle back. But basically, each zeppelin that you deploy in front of you is one action that you can take on your turn. Um, so it's very much about getting those zeppelins out there and forcing the other guys' zeppelins <laughs> to go into retreat. Um, uh, uh, so that you, you know, are able to lay out as many of the cards as you can on your turn, and they're able to lay out as few as possible. Right. right. Uh, so it's got it's got some interesting uh, uh, combat elements uh, uh, to it. That's actually specific focused combat, as opposed to all pl all other players lose a point or whatever. You know, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's much more. No, I'm going to go over there and foil Grillicon scheme. And oh, what just happened? Came up right, right, right. right you know, that that kind of a thing. Um, so your super villains fighting other super villains. Yes. That's yes, cool. It's too. essentially it's it's essentially a, a slugfest for who gets to mm. rule the world or what have you. <laughs> um. Because you know, the class classically, the supervillains always end up fighting because they, they never actually see eye to eye. They might have right. temporary alliances, but no. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's the vibe of it. We're also going to be uh, uh, looking in potentials for expansions with it. We've mm -hmm. got we've also got a two-player game that's related in theme um, called Zeppelin Conquest <laughs> um, that we're going to be providing as a um, at the very least, as a print and play um, secondary reward for, oh, very cool. uh, for 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 the backers um, uh, at like I think ten dollars and up. Um, so there's going to be some uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff, a lot of value that I think people will get out of it. Um, and uh, yeah, it, we'll we'll see how the Kickstarter does. Uh, I think we've well, <laughs> I know we've got at least one backer. Yes, but, uh, you have one. Uh, I think we're really pushing. Uh, because deck builder is such a um, strong and and fairly well developed uh, genre in card games in the, in the past decade, um, I think we're really uh, pushing deck builders in kind of a weird new direction mm. with uh, with a uh, Zeppelin attack that that I I at least haven't seen in the ones that I've been exposed to. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it either, and I've played a ton of deck builders, and that's one of the things that actually, after the Zeppelins and the Giant Apes, that immediately attracted me to the game. When you watch the gameplay video that, that brings you through the tutorial, I was immediately like, that's different, and yep. I've never done that before, and oh, look at yep. that, that's different too. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I think it may come off like it's uh, uh, complicated, but it it is in in play. It is very not complicated. Mm. You know, what, once you've once you've gotten a, well, once you understand how the attack defense dynamic works, and you understand like the different types and piles in in the center of the table, uh, uh, that that's like one playthrough. Right. Um, and then it's just it, it it clicks and it's it's a really wild ride. I enjoy it. Excellent. So Kickstarter has worked for Evil Hat before. I have a feeling it's going to work yes. again. Uh, my prediction is it'll work very well. I'm not psychic, <laughs> but I tend to be fairly good at judging games and, and what's going to work. And well, this companies. is one. This is one of the. Uh, this is one of the Kickstarters where we are trying to grow into a space that we aren't normally mm -hmm. in. Right. This is our, essentially our first card game. Yeah. Um, uh, Fate Core was amazingly successful for us, but it was also us playing to our core strength, sure. right? Um, so this is where it's it's you know it's it's half experiment and half yeah we've we've got a pretty good audience at this point, you know? So I, I feel like those those forces pu push and pull against each other to to make it a little bit of a uh, I don't know uh, we'll, we'll see how we do. 
I'm going to go out on a fairly thick limb, possibly even a trunk, <laughs> and, and say it's going to do pretty good. That That's my prediction. Again, not psychic. Can't raise your hand or anything like that, but I, I'll, I'll have a feeling you're going to do pretty well. Well, I, I will appreciate your your <laughs> your, uh, your uh, already declared support there. <laughs> <laughs> so Kickstarter works fairly well. You've also got this Patreon thing going on now, too. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little the bit Patreon, about that. The, the Patreon thing just kind of crept up on us. Um, it was one of those... Uh, you know, I, we, I have a uh, mailing list called mm -hmm. the Head, I, that which is the all the people who help me run Evil Hat. Yeah. Because um, uh, the hat goes on the head. Right. Um, and uh, I, I emailed to the Head right at the beginning of the year, saying, "Hey, I've been looking at like various folks, uh, Epi and uh, and uh, Joe and a few other people um, uh, using Patreon, uh, and you know, I've been trying to come to terms with it and understand what it." what it does, how it's different, why it's exciting. Um, and the thing that really uh, clicked for me, uh, particularly with looking at uh, uh, Epidiah Ravishal's uh, uh, Worlds Without Master, I believe, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is essentially a magazine, is that it's crowdfunding with a subscription. Yes. You can say all sorts of philosophy things about it and talk about how it's, you know, about it's being for artists who normally do stuff for free, and this is making sure that they they can keep producing this free stuff. And that's certainly a part of what drove the founding of Patreon, and is certainly part of its philosophy, and informs a lot of the stuff that's on their web comics and so mm -hmm. forth. But um, if you look at it as I tend to. From like the what is what what's its business function? It's the combination of subscription and crowdfunding, mm -hmm. and that is something that really is not supported well by most of the other, at least known to me, sure. crowdfunding platforms out there. So I found that really interesting, and then I put together sort of that free philosophy element of it with the well, we've had some success with. Fate Core, Fate Accelerated, Fate System Toolkit being pay-what-you-want products, what if we made this about creating pay-what-you-want adventures mm. because adventure content for, for our various role-playing games is, you know, essentially it's the fourth thing. Um, you know, you create the you create the core game, you create the uh, you create, like, maybe a setting supplement, you create maybe a rule supplement, yeah, maybe you'll get around to doing the adventures, right? Um, and adventures also seem to be um, a tougher sell, right? They're they're very very much uh, oriented uh, almost exclusively towards the GM, right? Um, so there are there are some questions essentially about whether or not it makes a lot of sense for us to put the time, the effort, the money mm -hmm. into developing adventure content at all. Uh, when we could focus more on, you know, games and simply rely on people to generate the adventures they want sure. um, uh, themselves. Uh, so this was kind of the, the, the question that I that I brought to the head and pointed at what was interesting about Patreon and said, okay, here's how I think we could structure it. And, they, and you know, we, we, we kicked it back and forth, refined the, refined the ideas a bit, um, and launched it at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. Close to it. Um, to essentially answer the question of, is it worth our time? <laughs> Are there enough people who are willing to put down money for, essentially on a guaranteed repeat basis for right. a stream of adventure content, four to six, four to six over the course of a year? And the answer is. Um, and the answer is ding 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 ding. <laughs> yes, not only that, but they, there are enough people who also want us to you know do it with fifty percent more word count than we were uh, right. projecting for it, and with color art. So I'm like, well, okay, <laughs> um, I, I will do that. And and also over a hundred people who were willing to put down twelve dollars per, you know, fifty thousand mm. word adventure, um, uh, uh, instead of like the four, which was essentially the entry right, right. Uh, thing, in order to have input about where we would go and like what talent we would pursue and that sort of thing. And that's a much larger number at that level than I was expecting. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a, huh, how do, we, how do we make sure that we, like, respect the fact that we've got 100-plus voices here that want to give us a certain amount of feedback? Right. How do we 
you know, get input from them, parse that, and in a way that doesn't become so much work, it includes actually getting the the stuff mm. made. Um, uh, so that's that's part of what we're working out now that we've had the oh okay we're gonna launch it in a week later all four <laughs> milestones have been hit. So good, <laughs> you know, it's worked out well. Yes. Um, uh, and right now we're also on, on the actual you know writing content development right. side. We're having a um, uh, internal dialogue about okay what does what do what does Evil Hat need to do for adventure design technology? Mm-hmm. Um, where you know where where can we take that and how are we going to do that? And we don't, we haven't gotten all that figured out because we figured we'd take a little bit longer to get all of that sorted. <laughs> um, but Rob Donahue was taking point on that and um, and you know he's been thinking a lot about sure. setting design technology and adventure design technology over the you know, past uh, many years. So uh, this is a chance for him to kind of distill that and yeah. and uh, uh, get the folks who did our initial raft of pitches to help. Um, you know, explore those ideas, figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, but we're still, you know, in that early process. Yeah. Um, and then there's the there's the first adventure, uh, which we did have written uh, at the time that we were launching it, which is also it's part of the impetus. I'm like, okay, I've got this one thing. I think we actually should have more like at least five of these. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, putting that together with the thoughts about Patreon, I was like, okay, and this will be the instant gratification. You know, the moment we hit certain milestones, I will simply give people the, the the raw text of this um, uh, so they can see that 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 adventure slash setting slash world uh, uh, thing and then we'll look at how the funding goes to determine um, what we're going to do with the art um, you know layout concerns etc sure. um, so um, you know now I know oh I'm going to be doing this in a color <laughs> layout and I'm going to be getting this guy paying him this much to, to, to do the art right um, and uh, yeah so the art buy on that is underway and that means that we'll probably have our first like finished content release by end of February early March something like that well it's still pretty quick that's not bad at all yeah well I mean yeah, it, it helps that we launched with a finished te- sure, edited sure, text. Sure, sure. Um, as far as the other stuff like uh, uh, Save Game um, and I'm not remembering Shoshana's Western Vampires thing, but the Western Vampires colonial thing. Um, uh, and there's a Roman uh, uh, investigator, essentially detective drama, mm-hmm. uh, one uh, called Eagle Eyes. From Pete, and then there's the Fist of the North Star tribute ah. for Quinn. Um, yeah, so all four of those should should go in some very interesting interesting directions. Um, and you know, uh, uh, as we kind of find our feet through those, through the development of those, um, and through the work with Rob, you know, then we'll be ready to do a second round. Excellent. Uh, and and keep pushing. So, you know, as as long as people are willing to stay. <laughs> subscribe to uh, Patreon uh, uh, thing. We're gonna we're gonna keep going with that, and like, like I said, get at least four, uh, hopefully more uh, adventures out per year. Great. Um, uh, and that's been made possible through you know again the magic of crowdfunding, yes. <laughs> well developed well well developed audience, and uh, uh, you know our wonderful core fans. Yeah. So that's that's Patreon. I'm going to have a link to the Kickstarter. I'll have a link to your Patreon page as well um, in the show notes once this goes out. And we're starting to get a little short on time, so I just want to go over... <laughs> I, I warned uh, you. I yeah. warned you I would talk and talk and talk. It's the kind of problem I like having, believe me. <laughs> um, so I, I want to go over what's hot right now with Evil Hat and anything that we haven't covered that's coming out in the near future. Sure. Um, let's see. Well, you've got the Zeppelin attack Kickstarter mm-hmm. coming up. That's that's coming up hot and soon. Um, the layout on Atomic Robo has been more twisty and intricate than anticipated, particularly with the timeline chapter, I think, uh, but a number of other things as well. But that's still making like steady progress day day to day. Where I can't I can't say what exactly that means for the release date, but uh, you know we do have all of the art. Woohoo! Um, uh, uh, so this is really just a get the layout done, get the index done, get that into layout, send it off to print production kind of thing. Right. So we're, these are the final steps. They're just some long steps. Mm. Um, uh, but that's that's going to be a, 
uh, I believe, a first first half of the year release for us. Um, we're going to be there's a, there's an, <laughs> there's another Kickstarter coming a few months later um, after uh, Zeppelin Attack for the Designers and Dragons uh, uh, series, which is a uh, four decade history of role playing games. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you want to go over to Evil Hat's site right now, we have the first book's TSR chapter up, available free. It's over 100 pages long. Um, You're killing and, me here, Fred. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and it's amazing. Yeah. It's, um, it's, uh, it's amazing, both in the ways for you know the view of how things were, but also how things are. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's it's the it's it's that oh yeah, that's familiar, that's familiar, that's familiar. <laughs> um, just the names have changed. Uh, so you know, there's some just some fascinating stuff uh, uh, in that. But uh, uh, Shannon Applecline, who's one of the people who uh, helps make RPG Net go, um, did all of this research. It's a compilation of a bunch of articles and 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 like some deep deep mm. deep research that he has done. Um, uh, and each book is split out by decades. So you'll have the 70s book, the 80s book, the 90s book, and the aughts book. Um, uh, and uh, uh, covers dozens of companies. Uh, and I, I, having read, I did the initial layout on the 70s book. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it was very hard for me to do it efficiently. Like, I, I pride myself on speed <laughs> when it comes to layout. I'm not necessarily the most graphically talented, but I will do something reasonably elegant and fast. But I was not fast with it because I kept <laughs> stopping and actually, like, really looking at the text as opposed to thinking of it as, oh, it's this block of art text, asset yeah. that I have to flow. Uh, no, I would actually sit down and read the chapter and it, 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 you know so the layout went at the speed of reading which is not as fast as the speed of layout um, so I guess this, it's, that brings up my second beef now with Evil Hat you're, you're killing me <laughs> well, you know, with, I mean, on on that theme, you know, we did get we did get all eight units of the of the styles of the the fate dice from that Kickstarter out by the end of 2013, mm. um, uh, which was a bit of a uh, logistical feat, but you know, worth a victory lap. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, uh, and those have been doing very well for us. Mm. Um, I'm very happy. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm still geeked about the fact that we've produced, you know, a uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of dice. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and the, just the styles are, are 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 crazy, crazy delicious. I love the antiquity set. I love a lot of the stuff in the second mm. batch, uh, which came out like essentially in December. Um, uh, and I hope people give those a look. Uh, we've got a bunch of the what is it? The third wave? I think it's the third wave of the Fate Core Kickstarter stuff um, uh, in development right now. I'm talking about uh, Doe: Fate of the Flying Temple. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about Young Centurions, uh, the role-playing game. Um, Dresden Files Accelerated development has begun in Excellent. as we said. Yeah. It happened in 2013, but we hit 2014 and we're like, okay, these people knew they needed to be freed up. They are freed up. We've got Let's go. On that. <laughs> I'm going to hit the microphone for extra emphasis. Um, oh, the Shadow of the Century. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's in development. We've got War of Ashes uh, role-playing game, which is a license we weren't expecting to come to us, but did, um, and is is going to be very interesting. Um, uh, we just uh, we just released the print version of the Fate Freeport Companion um, uh, in partnership with Green Ronin. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, they were they knew they were going to get the PDF out there in the world, and we came to them and said, you know what, we <laughs> we've got some money um, uh, for, thanks to uh, Fate Core doing as well as it is. We've got some money. Let us let us like bankroll an actual print run. We think mm. there's going to be enough interest in it um, that that uh, it's going to make sense to have it out there in print. We'll take care of the distribution, all that. You'll get a cut, uh, and that worked out. That worked out well. So people have been great, uh, and we just released that. I think essentially beginning of the year. Um, so yeah, I mean, we just, you, you, you're going to keep hating me because because <laughs> we, we we especially thanks to what what Fake Core has done. The Kickstarter is done for us. 
you know, we've essentially gotten capitalized to the point where we're able to really do a not necessarily regular. You can't say, oh, well, it's another 90 days, another thing's right. going to happen. Right. But, um, uh, but we have a much steadier stream of stuff coming out, and that's that's the point. That's what we wanted to do. Um, the good news is, um, you know, it it takes at least five to seven years before we will let a a title go out of print. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, as is starting to happen with some of our much older stuff that's kind of been showing its age for the last couple of years. Um, uh, so you're going to have a really wide window to <laughs> catch up to any of the stuff that seemed interesting to you, but you couldn't afford it at the time. So you know, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can to keep that stuff available. There you go. Well, as a fan and as a player, that's the kind of hatred that fuels me and spurs <laughs> me on and keeps me coming And it back. keeps me uh, warm. That's right. <laughs> so where can we find you and where can we find Evil Hat Online? You can find Evil Hat online at evilhat.com, strangely enough. Um, and you can find me blogging occasionally uh, at deadlyfriendly.com, spelled like it sounds. Yeah. Uh, and uh, most especially on Google Plus, I'm plus Fred Hicks, I think, in the little personalized URL thing. Uh, and on Twitter uh, at Fred Hicks. Um, and yes, I, I I talk a lot even without a microphone. <laughs> so um, you know, be be warned. <laughs> But uh, I try to make sure it's fairly high content, uh, fairly high signal. Excellent. And all of these, of course, will be in the show notes. So anybody who goes to the site, you can just click on the links, and you you can see everything that Fred is doing on a, almost a moment by moment basis here. Almost. Um, almost. <laughs> um, near real time. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just have one final question um, for uh -oh. you, and this this is um, what I like to close the podcast out with, um, because as a gamer, as a tabletop gamer, I'm sure as you know, it's a social experience. When you sit down to game with other people, it's a very social thing. You're not doing it alone. Um, you, you're doing it to hang out with other folks, other like-minded folks, and share an adventure. Mm -hmm. To me personally, it is not a social experience unless I can bring some kind of food or beverage to the table. Huh. So my question for you is, given your druthers, what is your favorite gaming snack and or drink? What would you bring to your table? <sighs> some of that depends on the game. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm quite fond of a good red wine uh, uh, with uh, uh, things like amber. Um, Snacks. Oh, nothing. See, yeah, I, I, I think, I think, I think more about meals. Like, yeah. I, I like, I like, I like gaming that starts with a meal or ends with one, or takes that break for it. So, uh, like, the quintessential gamer food for me is uh, gamer chili, mm. which, which doesn't mean you chop up your gamers and put them in a pot. <laughs> as delicious as that might be. Did I say that out loud? Uh, uh, it's uh, it's slow cooker chili, right? You 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 open a bunch of cans into it. You do your <laughs> jars of salsa. You do your you, you know you maybe you brown brown some ground turkey or something like that and get that in there. Whatever. I've actually got a uh, recipe for that up on Deadly Fredly if you search for it. I will search for um, that. Uh, yeah, that would be another good thing for the show notes. But yeah, mm. that that's that's the food for me is uh, uh, you know uh, something that <laughs> essentially. Cooks itself while you're gaming, and then you turn around and go, "Ah, the big fight scene is over or about to happen. Let's get some food in us uh, uh, and and talk about what has gone and what will come." Excellent. Um, yeah, that's that's sounds, that's the gaming food for me. Sounds thoroughly appetizing, and as always, I screw myself in these things because I make myself hungry right before I end the podcast. <laughs> um, Fred, I want to thank you so much for for taking the time to come on with me and chat. Absolutely. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you.